If the music here doesn't touch us, we're hopeless. Well, my name is Dr. Tom Toole, as you know, and no, I'm not a medical doctor, even though I'm dressed like this. I'm a spiritual doctor. I work for the great physician, our Lord Jesus Christ. When I walked in this morning, somebody was kidding with me. I put on this doctor's outfit and they said, hey, doc, I got a pain in my elbow. Can you give me any prescription for the pain? Well, I didn't come to give you a prescription for pain for your elbow. I came to give us prescription from the great physician for life as it was meant to be lived. And the question of the message is, are we living life the way God intended it to be? Or are we missing life in some way? Our scripture for today gives us a prescription for how to live life as God meant it to be. And as you listen to this scripture, think about, am I living the way God wants me to live, or is there something missing from my life? The prescription comes to us from the, in the form of Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 to 40. As those words are coming on the screen, I want to say to you that if we took these words seriously, we would change the way we live. So watch out. These words might change your life. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then one other verse from Proverbs 4, verse 13. And this is really speaking to us about the heart. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her. For she, your heart, is your life. These, are the, these things are the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, pour your spiritual IV into our veins of our life so that we might not only hear your word today, but we might heed it and we might become the people you've called us to be. And I pray that these words would raise questions in our mind about the way we are living so that we might start some new behavior patterns that will change our life. To that end, pour through me the gift of preaching that these words might truly be your living word to us. And we know they will be, for we pray with anticipation in the strong name of the great physician, Jesus Christ. And may all the people of God say, amen. Life, L-I-F-E. Are we living life as God intended it to be, or is there something missing from your life or from mine? So often some people miss life because they take the I out of the word L-I-F-E and they exaggerate it. And everything becomes about me, me, me. Self-fulfillment, self-aggrandizement, everything is about us. And we can become narcissistic. Some people take the IF out of the word life, and they live an if-only life. If only I made more money, if only I had a different job, if only my boss would change, things would be better. If only my wife or husband would change, things would get better. If only I lived somewhere else, if only I made more money, if only, if only, if only. Other people take the LIE out of the word life, and they start living a lie. They don't like who they are, so they try to be somebody else. Or sometimes we're ashamed of ourselves or something we've done, and our self-esteem and self-image is compromised. Tell me, BPC, has the I, the if, or the lie crept its way in a sinister way into your life or into mine? Now, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus gives us this amazing prescription for how to live life in balance, how to move from busyness to a balanced life where there's time for God, time for ourselves, time for the significant people of our life, and time for the world in need. But in this text, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were debating, as they often did. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, so they're having a religious debate, and they bring Jesus into it when the Pharisees ask him, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Now, this is a tough question. 
Jesus has got to think through the Ten Commandments and all the words of Moses and all the words of the prophets, Elijah and Jeremiah and Isaiah. And so Jesus is kind of wondering what he's going to say. And he goes back to pick the central tenet of the Jewish faith. In fact, today, if you go to a Jewish synagogue or if you go to a Jewish wedding or a Jewish celebration, they always begin with what's called the Shema, S-H-E-M-A. It's a Hebrew word meaning hear. They always start every religious service with hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So Jesus took something very familiar and then added to it from Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then said, on these two commandments rest all the Jewish law. And everything the prophets said, they have their foundation here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love neighbor as you love yourself. So what Jesus is suggesting is that love of self grows out of love of God. And love of neighbor grows out of love of God. And all the relationships of life are intertwined. They're all interrelated. If you don't love yourself, you really don't love God. If you don't love your neighbor, you really don't love God. You can't say you love God and hate your neighbor or hate yourself. And the Bible talks about this. All the relationships of life are interrelated. Now, before I ask you four questions about these four relationships, I want to raise up a hazard, the deadly enemy of the spiritual life busyness. Does anybody else struggle with busyness, being overcommitted? And now as COVID is subsiding, we hope, there's more opportunities for things in person, aren't there? And now people are trying to decide, what do I say yes to? What do I say no to? Should I say yes to more things? Should I wear my mask or not wear my mask? All these questions we've got to deal with. But the busyness, or what I call hurry sickness, is often the deadly enemy of the spiritual life. In Chinese, the word for busy is two characters. One is the word heart, and one is the word death. In other words, if you're too busy, your heart is dead. In other words, you can't see life all around you. You can't feel life. You, you, you become insulated from life. So the Chinese are saying busyness can kill your heart. We can often forget that our self-esteem and our self-image doesn't come from being a human doing, it comes from being created in the image of God. Our human value as people comes from the fact we're created in God's image, but we often think our busyness, our doing, actually is what makes us valuable as a human being. So if we think our self-worth comes from just doing things, we'll get into bad patterns. For example, does anybody other than me often multitask, drive the car, drink coffee, talk on the phone, try to text. Even I've seen some people putting on makeup as they're driving the car, or hopefully at a traffic light. Have any of you ever multitasked? Or have you ever gone to a grocery store and you know you gotta pick which line you're gonna go in? So you pick your line, and then once you make your pick, you've gotta look at somebody in the other line. Have you ever done this? And seen where you would have been in that other line if you'd chosen that line. And then you get mad at the sales clerk for not being slow, for being so slow that you, you were held up. Have you, anybody, nobody's ever done this, have you? Or have you ever wanted a meal, you've been starving, and you're with somebody in your car, a family member or a friend, and you're starving, and you really need to go into a restaurant or a place to eat something, but you don't have time for it, you're too busy, so we often go through the drive through and we eat while driving in the car as nature intended. What, what <laughs> sense does that make? Carl Jung says that we are drawn to hurry. Listen to this because it is the status symbol of our culture. It's status and makes you important if you are very busy. And Jung says, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Rollo May, the great psychologist said, it is an odd and ironic habit of human beings to move faster when we have lost our way. So, the four questions God wants us to consider today. Now, question number one, are you making room in your life for God? Are you making adequate time to love the Lord your God? We sing about it with all your heart, soul, and mind, but do you make time, make room in your life for God? 
I've got a friend named Marjorie Banks, and she's a potter at the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C., and she's a brilliant potter. She's also a spiritual guide and spiritual teacher, but I've seen her many times take dry, thick, brittle clay that's tough and put it on a potter's wheel and set the wheel in motion. She turns on the water, and the water is moistening the clay, and after a while, the clay gets pretty moist, and she can start to mold it. So she takes her left hand and puts it into the clay, which she calls making a spirit space. And then she takes her right hand and puts it against the clay, and she makes resistance to it. Now, Bankson says, if the left hand exerts more influence on the clay than the right hand... The potter can mold that clay into whatever the potter wants, a bowl or a, a plate. It can mold it into whatever you want. But as soon as the right hand exerts more pressure on the clay than the left hand, the pot will rise and then it will collapse. Anybody see a sermon in there somewhere? <laughs> so Banks is saying the left hand is the God's spirit space in you. As long as God exerts more influence in your life than the outer pressures of life, and we all know about outer pressures, what other people want us to be, what other people think of us, what other people want us to do. If the outer pressures of life exert more influence on us than God within us, our life will rise for a time and then it will collapse. But as long as God puts more influence into our life, God can then mold us into whatever God wants us to be. If I had to sum up how do you make room for God, how I make room for God, I would do it in one word, silence. We don't have a lot of silence in our lives, do we? I don't have a lot of silence in my life, but I try to make time. In fact, I do make time for silence every single day. It is not easy. I try to put out the distractions and take 15 minutes. So sometimes it's a lot longer, but I take 15 minutes every day. Five minutes, I just read a portion of Scripture. A chapter a day is often my practice, or a half a chapter a day, or sometimes I focus on one verse, but if I take five minutes every day to focus on Scripture, it helps me make room for God. Secondly, I take five more minutes, and I give to God all my concerns about our nation, about the world, about the Ukraine, about our family, about myself, any concerns I have about what's going on in our society, or what's going on in our neighborhood, what's going on in my life. Then I take five minutes and I just listen to God. And I just say, God, what do you want to say to me? And I open my hands, as you've heard me say before, I open my hands, and I just say, say to God, is there anything you want to say to me? And so often God gives me advice in that time, or God will say something to me. But if I'm not listening, I don't hear it. But if I can take time to just listen to God for what God is saying. And I often pray, Lord, open my creative imagination. I've got my wife, Suzanne, and I've been married 51 years. We've got two grown sons, and they're both married, and they're married to wonderful wives. And sometimes, you know, being a mom in this society is not easy. So I pray, Lord, do you have any creative ideas for me how to love Holly and Katie, our daughters-in-law? And sometimes God gives me creative ideas out of the blue. And, and when we act on them, I send her a text, or, or Suzanne and I will send flowers to Holly or Katie, or, or we'll give them a date night out, or, or we'll send them a gift certificate for dinner. And Holly or Katie will text us back or call us and say, Mom and Dad, how did you know we needed that? Well, we didn't know. We just got the idea from God. I'm telling you, if you open yourself to listen to God, there's no telling what God's going to say to you. Are we making room in our life for God? It's a prescription for the healthy life. Secondly, are we making time in our life to love ourselves, to take time to care for ourselves? A woman I know named Freud... She's married to Dick, and they often go to meetings. They go to many, many church meetings, and before COVID, they were going to many meetings in person. And one night, uh, Freud and Dick were supposed to be at a meeting, but Freud didn't show up, and we said to Dick, where is Freud? He said, she's over-peopled. And we said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, she loves people. She's an extrovert, but she's just had so many people in her life the last few days that she just needs a night off. She's over people. We said, well, what's she going to do? What's she doing with this night off? And he said, well, when I left, she had poured a glass of wine, and she had uh, gotten some cheese and crackers, and she was eating the cheese and crackers, enjoying a glass of wine, and, and she was reading a favorite book. And then she said she was going to light some candles. She was going to take a, a long, leisurely bath. We all said, gosh, we're overpeopled ourselves. We want to we wanna join Freud at the house, you know, and, and do something kind of, kind of like that, take care of ourselves. You know, taking care of ourselves without guilt 
is an important thing. Busy people like all of us at BPC, we're busy, busy, busy people, and we're often doing great things like Carol with Amnesty International, but are we taking time to care for ourselves? To just have a glass of wine without guilt and have cheese without guilt and a long leisurely bath without guilt. You know, God gave us 10 commandments. God didn't give us six commandments and four do the best we can. So taking a Sabbath day is not a suggestion, it's a commandment. So are we taking time for yoga? Taking time for silence? Taking time for listening to God? Are we taking time for exercise? Taking time to eat right and have good nutrition? These are not great suggestions, they're great commandments. Are we taking care of ourselves and loving ourselves? Question number three, are we loving the significant people of our life, our family, our friends, lifelong friends? Are we taking time to care for the significant people of our life? Or are we giving our family and friends the leftovers of our time and attention? I know a little girl named Megan, she's almost four. She was standing near her father one day and she won a goodnight kiss from her daddy and she, mom, her mommy said if she would stand next to her dad that eventually he would uh, come and give her a hug and kiss. But he was working on his computer. He was a big, important executive. He was typing in his computer. He was giving charts and graphs for the board meeting the next day. He's getting everything all set up and, and then the next morning he was gonna go and make copies and give it to the board of directors. He's doing this very important, busy work and this little girl, Megan, is standing next to him, his little daughter, she stood there for 10 minutes. The guy didn't even notice her. Finally, he turns to her, and he's irritated. He says, Megan, what do you want? What do you want? She said, well, Daddy, Mommy said if, you, if I stood beside you, you'd give me a hug and kiss. Okay, okay. So he turns and gives her the hug and kiss, and then says, now go, 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 go. Dad's got a very important job to do. But Megan didn't leave. Five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by, the father then looks over and realizes there's a little daughter sitting there, and this time he's mad. He says, Megan, what do you want from me? I gave you the hug and kiss, now what more do you want? And she said, well, Daddy, you did give me the hug and kiss, but, but you weren't in it. Isn't that a wise little girl? You know, you can give a hug and kiss to somebody. You, you can make a heart, but, but you're not in it. You can give somebody a birthday card or a very expensive gift for an anniversary or a birthday or a celebration of something, but if you're not in it, it doesn't mean anything. Are you loving the people of your life or are we giving them leftovers? This is an existential question for me and my wife. We've been very busy people for many years, married 51 years, as I said, but we decided our older son was in the Navy and he goes all over the world every two years. And we decided when we retired, we'd live near our younger son and his three little children. We've gotten to know our older four grandchildren. We have seven grandchildren. We've gotten to know the older four over the years. The oldest one is 22. Our youngest granddaughter now is four. So we've got grandchildren between the ages of four and 22. But the other older four are scattered in college and beyond and working and some of them in high school if they're just finishing up. But these three little ones we could spend some time with now. So we decided to, to, to live near them in California here, in Southern California. We'd never lived in Southern California. We love the weather, but what we love most of all is living near these grandchildren and our son and daughter-in-law. And the other night, our little seven-year-old grandson caught a fly ball in a little league game. He got under the ball and he caught it. And when he, the joy on his face when he caught that ball was so amazing, I'm so glad we didn't miss that. But I want to tell you, I've missed a lot of moments in our children, our grandchildren, in my wife's life, and I don't want to miss these moments anymore. Anybody feel the way I do? You, you want to be there for those important moments of life? You know what they are. So I ask you the question, are we taking time to love the significant people of our life? And the fourth question is, are we taking time, making room in our life to care for a world in need? This is a tough one because the needs of the world are so amazing. Amnesty International and, and the Christophers and the Jesuits have often said it's better to light one candle, as Carol said so beautifully this morning, than to curse the darkness. But the darkness is so dark. There's one person every second leaving Ukraine in the humanitarian crisis and their parents and grandparents putting children on a train 
well, how do we care for them? Well, we can give through Presbytery Disaster Relief, and that's a help. And, but I heard the other day that Americans are very creative. They learned, Americans did, many Americans did, that there are millions of VRBOs, vacation rental by owner, in the Ukraine. So 400,000 Americans across this country are donating to VR, through the VRBO to rent a VRBO in the Ukraine. Now, they're never going to use it because there's war happening in that country. But they've given the money to get money to the Ukrainian people in that way through PayPal and other organizations to get their money so they can be giving money to the Ukrainian people in their time of need. Other people giving through Presbyterian Disaster Network. But what are you doing? What am I doing? It's, it's one thing to curse the darkness. It's, it's quite another matter to light one candle. This is why your work is so important, Carol, Amnesty International, to do one little thing well. When I go to our sons' houses and their wives and their children, I always see pictures on the refrigerator of children they've adopted in a third world country. They're paying for their education. They're paying for water in the community. They're giving 12 or 15 or $20 a month, but it's making an enormous difference in a village. And I'm thinking, gosh, Am I lighting that candle? Are you lighting the candle? I heard a statistic recently that's very troubling that Princeton University did a survey that people, sociologists, can know in the second grade whether a child is going to graduate from high school or graduate from college and being a functioning member of society. They can tell that in the second or the, the latest, the third grade because of the way they're growing up and who's raising them and the kind of community they're in and all that. But Princeton found if a child has six people other than their parents who know their name, think they're cool, take an interest in them, the chances of a child getting involved in juvenile delinquency or going to prison are less than 1%. So I've got a good friend who's tutoring, and as he tutors this child, he's keeping a child out of prison. Friends, it doesn't take a very big candle to shine a bright light. Are you making room in your life for God? Are you making room in your life for yourself to care for yourself? Are you making room for the significant people of your life? Are you making room in your life for a world in need? Years ago, I had a friend named Bill Leslie. Some of you heard me tell this at the School of Christian Living some years ago. But Bill Leslie is a very good friend of mine, and he was one of the most important and busiest people in the city of Chicago. He was pastor of LaSalle Street Church, was doing a phenomenal job, had a growing church, a busy ministry, and was on, on the, his church was on the edge of Cabrini Green where the poor people live in Chicago. And he had this fabulous ministry to the homeless, to the hungry, to the poor, to the broken. So he was on the Mayor's Commission for Homelessness, the Mayor's Commission for Hunger. He was involved with many organizations doing good work. Everybody wanted him to preach and do their wedding and do their funeral and, and be on their committee and be on their task force. And Bill Leslie looked at his cabinet calendar one year and realized that in a two-month period he was out 57 out of 60 nights busy 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 important 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 but he kept having this recurring dream that he's seatbelt in the back of a driverless automobile and he can't get up to the, get the steering wheel so he sits in the driverless automobile he tries to get over the seatbelt and get to the steering wheel but he can't get there he's being blocked by something and then he wakes up as he's crashing into other cars on the freeways of Chicago. What a graphic dream. He thought about which of his Protestant friends could he go to for help, and you know how many he could think of? Zero. Because he didn't trust anybody else. So he went to a Roman Catholic monastery, pulled in, parked his car, went to the door, rang the doorbell, and the priest came, and Bill said, oh, Father, I shouldn't have come. I'm, oh, the priest said, oh, Father, you come in, my son. You've come to the right place. And he said, what seems to be the problem, my son? And Bill told him all this. He, for an hour, Bill spewed out all this bile about all the, the services he was doing, all the caring for the poor, and the, the mayor's task force, and how busy he was, and the 57 out of 60 nights in the car, crashing into other cars. And Bill just said, my life is just a mess, Father. And Bill said, I, I don't suppose you have any advice for me. And the priest said, well, I, I don't have any advice. You've got to decide what you're going to do. But I do have an observation. And Bill said, what's the observation? He said, well, my observation is that you're living on surface water. You're trying to have this phenomenal, life-changing, magnificent ministry, and you've got to get your pipe done deeper. 
You, your pipe is only one sixteenth of an inch below the surface. You've got to put your pipe down deep into the subterranean streams of God's love deep below the surface. So it will be God doing all this work through you. It'll be God ministering to the poor through you. It'll be God flowing through you. You're trying to do too much on your own, Bill. And they said, Bill, if I could give you one word of advice, there's one word I would put into your vocabulary if I were you, carefully, lovingly, with God's help. But I would put this one word into your vocabulary. And Bill said, what's the word? and what do you think the word was no the priest said Bill it's okay to say no so that you can say yes more fully to God yes more fully to caring for yourself yes more fully to caring for your family and significant people in your life lifelong friends and yes to ministry in the world and in this chapter of your life you might say no to something that you can say yes to in two three or five years is anybody relating to any of this so the priest told this to bill and it changed bill leslie's life I wonder if this is going to change our life today. I close with a thought. T.S. Eliot, Eliot, the great writer, said, every now and then, life drops an unavoidable question at your door. What's the unavoidable question God's dropped into your life today? Are you making room in your life for God? Are you making room in your life for yourself? Are you making room in your life for the significant people of your life? Are you making room in your life for a realistic ministry to the world? I urge you to follow God's prescription, but watch out if you follow God's prescription for a balanced life to move off of busyness and move into a relationship with God and yourself and the significant people and the world. I warn you, this prescription of God's might just change your L. I-F-E. May it be so. Amen. Friends, all that we seek to accomplish, all that we strive to achieve, all that we claim to possess, all that we try to do to keep our calendars full and keep our schedules busy, all that we are, all of this is nothing, nothing without the grace and love and mercy and abundance.